without further ado, I am going to uh, introduce Ron. I'll ask Ron to. Uh, okay, I'll ask Ron to um, introduce himself. Unmute yourself, Ron. And um, I'm happy to work with Ron, uh, Dr. Ron Weisberger. He is a director at the center at Bristol Community College uh, and Genocide Center. So, Ron, go right ahead. Okay, everybody can hear me? Uh, um, I wanna welcome everybody. This is our, really our first program of this season uh, as the season is approaching, that is the fall um, semester. Uh, we, uh, as Gary mentioned, um, we got hijacked. We had a number of programs in the spring that we had to postpone those programs will be um, back. Uh, that is, we have two lectures that will be back uh, in um, in the fall through Zoom, and we're going to have another workshop that Tom is going to be doing for us, and we also have programming planned for the uh, spring. So we're we're moving ahead, and um, also as as um, Gary mentioned, uh, we are very pleased to be able to provide PDPs now. So we're gonna be working toward reaching out to the uh, regional teachers, both parochial and public, and hopefully collaborating with them on providing education, uh, this kind of important education, Holocaust and genocide. Um, and uh, with the coming legislation, Massachusetts is behind under states, unfortunately, as Tom would say, uh, New Hampshire's have done it, Delaware just passed, New Jersey's had it about 20 years now. But we'll catch up and we want to be involved in helping to provide uh, that uh, type of education as well as, of course, uh, the kind of education we've been doing for our, our faculty and students at uh, staff at uh, Bristol Community College. So uh, this is the beginning of our uh, new year and we're happy to, to, uh, to, to be able to put this workshop together. I want to thank so much. Um, Gary Brown for uh, doing all this work. He and I have worked very closely together uh, the last couple months or more actually. And um, Gary's a former superintendent of Old Colony Vocational School and uh, very much interested in this education. Um, Gary's wife, Judy has worked very closely with me too, helping to raise money and do other things as well. So really appreciate uh, the Brown support. <laughs> Uh, for sure, um, we need um, we need help uh, from the community, and we've been lucky to get that um, help. I want to, as usual, I want to thank the um, the uh, Jewish Federation of New Bedford um, for their uh, f help, financial support. Manya Bark, is, who's on here, is our is the president of the federation. Uh, we have the Jewish Alliance of Fall River provides, and we have also corporate. Uh, sponsors have helped us, uh, Bristol County Savings Bank, Bank Five, and Bay Bank have provided us some funds. And we also get funds from individuals and we're always happy to receive um, individual uh, contributions. Uh, all our programs are, are free, except usually for our artistic fundraiser, which we won't be doing this fall, but we'll be doing it hopefully in the spring. Um, so I, I wanna thank everybody uh, who does support also uh, our Jewish Federation uh, of New Bedford Holocaust Education Committee, uh, Cindy Yokin and Maria Reed are the co-directors and I've worked with them and they're always very supportive of us. And of course, our colleagues at Bristol Community College. So we all do this together. This is a collaborative effort, right? Um, and I, I'm very happy to be able to introduce Tom White uh, some of you may recall that Tom presented a couple years, about two years ago, I think, and uh, people really appreciated. And Tom is um, the outreach director of the Cohen Center at Keene State College. The Cohen Center is probably one of the premier centers in the country doing this kind of work. And um, Tom is, of course, is an integral part to that of that center. They're the only college, Keene State is the only college which provides an undergraduate degree in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. So it's amazing. I mean, there are uh, 
courses, you know, different schools, there's master's programs and also a doctoral program, but Keene State does, has an undergraduate program. And the, Keene, the Cohen Center is integral part of that, of that program. Um, Tom is also among other honors. He's a, a, a member of the New Hampshire Governor's Commission on Holocaust and Genocide Education. He's also a very active member of the uh, Association of Holocaust Organizations. We belong to that as well, but I know Tom's very active in it. Um, he presents around the country. I, I uh, attended one that he did out of Seattle, Washington uh, earlier in the summer. So uh, we are very happy to have him come here to do a workshop today. And we're looking forward to the one that will um, be in the spring, I mean, in the fall as well. Uh, I just want to mention that you can get information on our programming um, from our, our webpage and also our, we have two Facebook sites and now Twitter. So I want to thank uh, Judy Brown, uh, Pat Weisberger, uh, Mary Hyde, Mary and Tori Hyde are doing our Twitters now, uh, all um, and our communications department at Bristol Community College, which are dealing with our all our social media. So if you want any information, uh, and these um, you can go to our sites and find out what we're up to and what we're going to be doing. So with all that, I want to introduce Tom White. Thank you. And am I up? I think I'm up. Yeah, now you're up, Tom. Thank Perfect. You. Um, Ron, uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, I love working with Bristol Community College. I wish I could be there with you in person, but uh, I think this would be very effective. And Gary, thank you so much for coordinating all the technical aspects of this. Um, what I want to do is I want to uh, work through some of the difficulties of this topic and then uh, have plenty of time at the end for uh, Q&A session. And uh, along the way, uh, you'll have access to sort of an overview of what we're gonna do. And uh, everything that, uh, that I present here, you'll have access to. And uh, although we've discovered that videos and audios don't necessarily coincide on Zoom, uh, if it does work out great, if it doesn't, all of our videos and a whole lot more that I didn't include today are on our YouTube page. So if you're curious about finding anything we do, um, the Cohen Center YouTube page would be uh, your thing. So I'm gonna just dive right in because I know all of our time is precious. I'm gonna to go to the hopefully share screen here and uh, make sure we get this right. And fingers crossed that we're, does everybody see that okay? Uh, yes. Terrific. So I'm gonna start here uh, at Auschwitz uh, and try to figure out how to take an irrational set of uh, uh, actions, anti-Semitism, which I pluralize because I don't find it easy to uh, ha have an easy definition of what we're about to examine and try to give sort of a, a linear construct to something that isn't linear, that isn't easy to figure out. I'm gonna focus on how ideology functions as hatred and as hatred informs one's identity, both individually and collectively to create this mix of different hatreds that collectively is known as anti-Semitism. I start with a Holocaust survivor who kind of put it this way and trying to describe his experience. And he said, in the end, I realized they were telling me I didn't say it was your fault, whatever it is we were being blamed for. I merely said I was going to blame you for it. And I think a lot of that has to do now with the mentality of the perpetrator and their construct of identity. They need a target, and thus the silly kind of image on the left. But I think anti-Semitism itself will reveal very little about Jews, uh, but will reveal a whole lot more uh, about the people who need to believe in, in such constructs. My uh, first opening statement will be that anti-Semitism makes people stupid. Uh, we'll talk about that along the way. That doesn't mean they're not still dangerous, of course, uh, Anti-Semitism is dynamic, durable, shifting, and changing. And we know it's toxic for democracies, which is why this is such an important topic for us to be wrestling with. Anti-Semitism is warning, not just for Jews and not just for democracies, but for everyone. And so I find this a very poignant moment where 
the Muslim community uh, immediately responded in Pittsburgh to the shooting that happened there uh, by a white nationalist uh, and immediately uh, began to protect the synagogue. And this happened also in Norway. Uh, it actually happened the day after 9-11 where Muslims came out uh, and said, no, this concerns all of us. So today what we're gonna try to do is see what the threat is, identify it and give some constructs to maybe wrestle with in the classroom. So what I will do today in my anti-Semitism presentation is give a, we'll start with an overview, uh, a survey of what current anti-Semitism look like around the world and in the United States. I will then uh, wrestle with anti-Judaism to anti-Semitism uh, we tend not to use the hyphen in using, uh, in, in using the term anti-Semitism. I'll try to describe why. I think it's quite different from anti-Judaism, which is the targeting of Jews on a religious basis. But anti-Semitism can be a little bit more difficult to kind of figure out, but we don't use the hyphen, and I'll try to explain why. And then finally, recognizing uh, what anti-Semitism is, reacting to it, and responding in appropriate ways. Uh, if this were, uh, and maybe we can do this, I know Ron and I are talking about another workshop at our Summer Institute for Teachers, we often will do this lesson and then uh, hit them with a challenge of some contemporary anti-Semitism and developing appropriate strategies for response. So we might mention that at the very end. These are the reflection questions I want you to consider as I'm presenting. Uh, it's also on the handout that I think you're receiving. Uh, and so you'll have access to that as well. But really as I present, uh, is anything new here for you? Uh, what is surprising? Uh, what is surprising about how I constructed it? What questions do you have? And I think with a, a topic like this, which has both a past life and a current life, it's sometimes hard to distinguish what's really going on. So questions are really important. Uh, what needs to be clarified is a way to help me make sure that I get the message out properly. Uh, what I, important ideas or themes are you seeing that are, you think, relevant to your classroom? Or if you're not a classroom teacher, just generally with your friends uh, and family? And am I going to challenge any of the assumptions you have about what anti-Semitism is and how it plays out? So here are some quick, uh, just dipping into some of the current anti-Semitic data that we have. This is from a November 2019 poll done by the ADL. And we'll just start off with some of the boxes. I won't read this verbatim and you can have access to the screen uh, later, it's being recorded. Uh, but one of the basic stereotypes that comes out of anti-Semitism is that Jews uh, are fond of business and making money and therefore it translates often into secret control of the economy. And the ADL found out that in Europe, 72% of Ukrainians agreed. And you're gonna see Eastern European countries, Hungary, Poland, uh, in Russia, significant numbers of people assume this just to be correct. Uh, the idea of Jewish disloyalty, we've heard this expressed uh, in uh, politics in our own country, uh, that Jews are more loyal to Israel than to their own country. Uh, more than 40% agreed in Austria, Belgium and Denmark, Germany, Italy, you can see the list of countries here. Muslim acceptance of anti-Semitic stereotypes uh, in Europe was substantially higher than amongst national populations, uh, on average almost three times higher, and you can see the countries here. However, at the same time, European Muslims uh, were significantly lower than respondents, say, in the Middle East and North Africa, which implies, and I'm just inferring here, that uh, as uh, Muslim communities, which are often impoverished, uh, are therefore uh, acculturated or assimilated in European cultures, Interesting enough, maybe perhaps anti-Semitism decreases. In Italy, we know that anti-Semitic attitudes have fallen as they have in Austria, and Austria has a very active uh, Holocaust education program. Uh, literally, if you uh, you can uh, defer service uh, in the military to service in uh, Holocaust education in Austria. Uh, support for the campaign of the boycott of Israel, uh, BDS. Uh, surprisingly uh, was relatively low in Europe. Uh, and I think that's very encouraging. The only exception they found really was South Africa that, and I don't have the percentage, but it was much greater than what they found in Europe. But I like to ask the targets what they think and what they feel. And I think it's important for you to know that I, your presenter, I'm not Jewish. I was raised in a Catholic tradition. Uh, and uh, so my 
encounter with this is from a different perspective. So I always want to hear what the target uh, thinks and feels. And so 90% of European Jews are surveyed by the European Union. So a different survey here. And a great percentage of them felt uh, that they had experienced harassment. And more significantly, 89% believed that anti-Semitism was increasing in their countries. Almost 80% felt like they could not report it to the police fearing uh, repercussion uh, or that nothing would be done. I think that's significantly alarming. In the United States, uh, this is the American Jewish Committee survey done uh, in the summer of 2019 saw a tremendous uptick in anti-Semitic violence in the past five years. Uh, more than 80% say they've witnessed an increase in anti-Semitic incidents in the U.S. Uh, and 43% indicate that it has been significant. And remember, these reporting numbers uh, are also skewed in the sense of often victims don't report. Uh, and so this is, I would argue, a starting point, a minimum. Uh, the ADL reported a 150% increase in recorded incidents compared comparing 2013 to 2018. So something clearly is happening. The FBI, uh, you can see hate crimes here directed at Jews and that a significant number of religious-based hate crimes are now directed at Jews. These are the last kind of two charts I'll show. There are many ways to do this, but you'll see uh, trying to break this down between politics. Is there some kind of political explanation the far right, far left? And so you have anti-Semitic basic tropes that we're going to explore here coming up. And you can see there's not much difference here between uh, liberal and conservative, uh, almost an equal kind of uh, acceptance uh, in either camp. What you do see differences, I think, on the right-hand side is anti-Israeli sentiment, much more pronounced uh, in, uh, in liberal uh, conversation. So... This is something that I like to uh, start with in your classroom, because what we're really talking about here is not so much creating boogeymen, they're all out there, but how does one identify, respond to and explore in a classroom uh, what anti-Semitism is without immediately politicizing it? And so this was uh, a colleague of mine and uh, a few of his uh, colleagues, uh, Mark Weitzman from the Simon Wiesenthal Center, who helped to craft this working definition, which is now the accepted definition of the US State Department. Uh, and also the UN and others in trying to define uh, what is anti-Semitism. This is not to assign blame, pointing a finger saying, you're an anti-Semite, aren't you a horrible human being? But to basically foster awareness and discussion in your classroom and give your students the tools by which they themselves can identify what is uh, or is not anti-Semitism. So the definition that the working definition says, anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property toward Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. And this is now separate from the working definition, but anti-Semitism frequently charges Jews with conspiracy uh, to harm humanity, often used to blame Jews for why things go wrong, uh, and you can see expressed in speech, writing, visual forms, or many ways, of course, uh, to employ these sinister stereotypes. As you're, and we're about to wrestle with this together, uh, I think one of the major shifts that we're going to see, and this is why when you hear conspiracy theories constantly being floated, uh, now you're in very dangerous waters. We're gonna look at anti-Judaism as a long lasting phenomenon. But when the world got to the point of saying that Jews are behind some kind of conspiratorial behavior, that's when it became lethal. And when we're talking about conspiracies almost flippantly today, that's why those in the field of uh, studying anti-Semitism are quite concerned. Now on the sheet that you have or will have or is presented I think by, uh, by Gary, uh, there is a series here of sort of bullet points of how to have students identify by searching uh, mass media, uh, newspapers, friends, uh, sort of check boxes of things that they can try to use to identify if it's anti-Semitism or not. I'm not gonna go through all the different boxes, but I'm just gonna show you a few of them uh, and show you how uh, you can work through some of these to identify anti-Semitic behavior and thought. So contemporary examples in our public space, and again, these boxes are all on your handout. Uh, calling for, aiding, or justifying the killing or harming of Jews, 
in the name of a radical ideology or an extremist view of religion. The obvious one would be Hezbollah uh, here. And of course, uh, well, I, I can't speculate as to what happened in Beirut, uh, but people wonder if there was a connection there. Uh, but Hezbollah, of course, sworn enemies of Israel and sworn to kill every Jew they possibly can uh, in the Middle East. But let's get a little more closer to home, not to beat really a dead horse here, but the Unite rally in Charlottesville, uh, I hope still frightens us as much as it should. And the reason why I want to sort of combine these two images is when you're looking at the organizers of the Unite the Right blood and soil rally that was Charlottesville and continues, one of the organizers was Matthew Heimbach. And Heimbach is here showing just before the rally uh, a symbol you would have seen at the rally. The other symbols were pretty clearly aware of the Nazi flag, the Confederate slave flag. Uh, but were you aware that he would show this flag as well, which was the flag of the Romanian Iron Guard, which was the World War II fascist party that participated in the Holocaust. And so this is a clear symbol to Romanians, uh, fascist and nationalist, which now, of course, uh, this alt-right movement in America isn't an isolated American event. Indeed, the headquarters of them is in Europe. Uh, and of course, your mass media are uniting and doing very similar things globally. For example, the Pittsburgh shooter, uh, and many of our friends and colleagues were there, of course, uh, was in touch with Heimbach uh, and other leaders of the alt-right rally uh, before the Pittsburgh shooting. Uh, the Christchurch shooter, uh, in, of course, we saw that one as well, who, who killed Muslims, uh, was using symbols on his uh, automatic assault weapon uh, that were popularized by Heimbach here uh, of the American extremist right movement. A white nationalist, although this is not the focus so much of this presentation, I separate from, well, separates too strong of a word. I distinguish from white supremacists in that for me, white supremacists are sort of the inherent nature of the American experience uh, from the early days of defining what a US citizen is as a white male through slavery, through reconstruction and through on and on. White nationalists are a relatively recent phenomenon. They're very few in number. These are sort of, uh, if you would, sort of right wing, almost brown shirted organizations that have really come to life with the internet. Uh, what we do know is though that their numbers are few, their influence might be a little more significant than we think. If one uh, asks uh, sort of the white community general questions about what do you feel about interracial marriage? Uh, what do you feel about uh, America being a, a, a European uh, founded country uh, by white people? You're going to see that a lot of white Americans sympathize with those core ideas. And so though they're not members of some radical organization, uh, there might be sympathy out there. And this is where these code words come in as very important for uh, the white nationalist movement. The white nationalist movement is rooted in anti-Semitism. It has many different expressions. It brings back the Confederate flag and all that, but at its core is anti-Semitism. Some code words you'll hear in the media, so it gets confusing, sorry, really quickly, <clears throat> is globalism. This idea that uh, they're losing a particular local identity to some kind of global cabal or conspiracy, which immediately goes to the Jewish conspiracy. And so often you'll have anti-globalism parades. Also in those parades will be a lot of anti-Semitic imagery. Hollywood, someone mentioned before our presentation today, reading the book about how the Jews created Hollywood, uh, how many Jews were there in Hollywood, uh, and do, of course, great expression and creativity. But Hollywood is a catchword uh, for these white nationalists about control over the media, control over imagery and thought, of course, which is all bogus and fake, leading to fake news, which, as we know, was uh, loosely, uh, this is uh, Josef Goebbels' uh, Ministry of Propaganda trying to reshift the truth in Nazi Germany, but we're all familiar with fake news today and the undermining of truth and uh, the questioning of truth. Academia, uh, the intellectuals of the East Coast, of course, are seen as the enemies, as they were in Nazi Germany. Uh, the uh, Germans were looking for sort of a, a yeoman farmer to settle the East and academics jumped on board with that, but there was great suspicion of the cities, uh, of, uh, of tolerance, these kind of things, which you see consistently with this movement as well. So liberal institutions such as education, 
and who knows what are always under attack. All Lives Matter, different topic with Black Lives Matter, and Antifa as looters. Uh, and Antifa is seen as a, uh, a cabal organized by a secret Jewish conspiracy. So we hear any of these terms in the public discourse. Uh, these are shout outs to the white nationalist community. As you know, there hasn't been a single arrest of anybody associated with Antifa and the looters that are creating the violence. All of them have been from white nationalist groups. Another kind of uh, bullet point here to have kids, you know, explore and wrestle with making mendacious dehumanizing uh, or stereotypical allegations about Jews uh, as such, or the power of Jews as collective, a secret force. Uh, especially, but not exclusively, uh, the myth about world Jewish conspiracy or of Jews controlling the media economy and so on and so forth. So here you have an American cartoonist who's very popular amongst the, the white nationalists, uh, Ben Garrison, uh, showing here uh, how Soros is a, a secret conspiracy. He's a new Rothschild, if you would, of the, of the 21st century, how he secretly behind the scenes controls uh, the American government. This kind of stuff, of course, is lethal because the Pittsburgh shooter uh, shot up that community uh, arguing, and he thought, because Soros was controlling the world economy and thus this George Soros sort of image had to be combated by killing Jews. Uh, and so this stuff becomes lethal pretty quickly. Accusing Jews as people of being responsible for real or imagined wrongdoings uh, committed by a single Jewish person or group, uh, or even acts committed by non-Jews. In 2009, uh, the Cohen Center got involved in a story only because one of our teachers had uh, translated her cousin's book from Lithuanian into English called A Partisan from Vilna. In that particular book, uh, Rachel Margolis, who was a partisan in the Second World War, who lost her family in Vilna uh, on July 4th in the Panari Forest, uh, had written in there that at one time her partisan group attacked a Lithuanian village and killed some Lithuanians trying to find food. Immediately, the Lithuanian prosecutor accused her of war crimes during the Second World War as this new book had been published and translated to English. What's interesting, of course, she was one of four Jewish elderly partisans accused by the Lithuanian prosecutor of war crimes. But as you all well know, in Lithuania, 90% plus of the Jews who were murdered in the Second World War were murdered by Lithuanians. And not a single Lithuanian was ever charged with a crime against humanity or war crimes. And so what you have here in 2009, this anti-Semitic moment whereby Rockwell is gonna be blamed for all the war crimes of the Second World War, and Jews, of course, will be targeted and villainized once again. Uh, immediately the world, we got the people to respond all over the world, consulates and ambassadors all wrote letters of support to her, and the Lithuanian prosecutor backed off. Uh, but this stuff keeps emerging as, as people are identified singularly and as being responsible for something greater. And the last one of these I'll show, because I can't do all of them given our time, is something that's gonna be, I think, surprising to you. Using symbols and images associated with classic anti-Semitism, stuff we will wrestle with here in a moment, uh, to characterize Israel and or Israelis. At the end of this, we'll wrestle with anti-Semitism and Israel. I'm gonna start here with Alison Veer. She, uh, her credentials are as an anti-Iraq war protester. She's an anti-imperialist. Her uh, website, If America Knew, uh, and the Council for the National Interest, uh, she's the president of. She is from the left. And so you're about to see anti-Semitism emerge from the left. A story came out that during uh, the struggles in the Middle East, that Israeli soldiers uh, were harvesting organs uh, of, uh, of Palestinians. Uh, I remember seeing this story uh, picked up almost everywhere uh, and immediately disproven uh, as something that was made up uh, in Sweden and exposed as a fraud. So right away you have another fraud story that became mainstream. What's interesting is the story, the story itself migrated from this publication in Sweden to her work to Counterpunch, which is sort of a a left-wing activist site. Uh, and even though it was discredited, uh, Weir writes in August of 20, uh, 2009 about how Israelis have been harvesting internal organs. Of course, this ties right into a look at later on the blood libel charge, 
But what's interesting about this particular story, though it was proven to be a fraud, was then picked up by the far right. The Institute for Historical Review or Historic Review is of course the American Nazi party publication uh, and they immediately then published the article. So what you see in this one little brief story is regardless of source, left, right, religious, non-religious, whether it's true or not, anti-Semites will accept it as truth. And what's really interesting for us today is this is no longer easily defined as a left-wing construct or a right-wing construct, but that, that doesn't matter as much anymore, so long as it's useful to both sides. So now we kind of begin uh, the presentation having given that brief overview. The questions that concern me and have uh, throughout my professional life uh, really is where does anti-Semitism come from and how does it give meaning to identity, both individual and collective identity? Uh, when you look at these studies, you realize the perpetrators themselves think that they're doing right. They do not see themselves as immoral, rather they see themselves as asserting their own morality. Uh, something that's required to them. Now, this is especially true in times of trauma, displacement, and confusion, real or perceived, it doesn't matter. But of course, we're now in a global pandemic, uh, and we're seeing now anti-Semitism uh, re-emerging, of course, or being reinforced. I'm going to try to simplify all this by using uh, the rabbi from Britain's sort of concept of anti-Semitism as a virus and I guess appropriate given the world we're living in, uh, how it will mutate to penetrate societal norms and therefore become normal. You have to realize that hate itself, we all do, that cannot be aired and sustained unless it's supported. And so what I wanna look at is historically over time, what sources or structures of authority or morality have legitimated anti-Semitism, made it speakable, when I get to this point, I often remember that what we're looking at here at Birkenau at the selection ramp and in this picture behind us on, over our right shoulder would be Crematoria 2 and over our left shoulder Crematoria 3 is that the Holocaust was not just possible, it was permissible. And I think that's a really significant moment about perpetrator behavior and identity issues. The statement for myself every day, uh, I live my life and dealing with this as a non-Jew is that any statement I make, and I hope in the coming presentation, I am very careful, uh, cannot be made without thinking of the burning children of Auschwitz. Uh, I have another presentation about the use and abuse of Holocaust imagery here, but just to make sure we know, a photograph taken by one of two photographers in Auschwitz in the summer of 1944, uh, actually early spring, uh, documenting uh, what was going on. So they're walking with the women and children already selected for, I believe, crematoria two, uh, it might be three, uh, and soon to be annihilated. And yet he found this uh, something uh, to remember. The little boy in the far left foreground is looking at the photographer. And over time, perhaps looking at us and wondering where we are uh, as we approach this topic. So if we can shift the perspective from ourself and defending the kind of things that we think we know and shift the perspective to those who are targeted who are looking at us, uh, I think is very helpful. So now I'm going to go way back in time and try to create my linear construct of anti-Semitism. I'm going back to the Roman Empire. And to preface this, I also, by the way, have a very long essay guaranteed to induce uh, sleep if you have insomnia. But uh, it will talk about hatred of Jews before the Roman era. But when you see that, what you're looking at is sort of very typical human behavior, uh, ostracizing the other, uh, you know, this idea of uh, uh, town versus uh, more urban people. These are all very explainable kind of things. But as a construct that Jews collectively all represent something, this comes out of the Roman Empire and specifically Christianity. This is where it begins. So I'm going to be using Rabbi Jonathan Sachs' concept of a mutating virus to describe three of the four phases of the development of anti-Semitism. The first mutation, if you would, of the virus appears here in the Roman world as Judeophobia, seeing Jews as religious enemies. So I'm going to start here at 4 BCE, the, uh, again, using sort of a the common calendar, but it's still Christian-based, isn't it, of the Jewish revolt against Roman occupying forces. 
And this is, again, uh, if you would, four years generally before Jesus was born, uh, that they are crucifying Jews uh, here outside of Jerusalem. So a very common experience for a Jew in this part of the world was to see and witness crucifixion as a form of punishment. In that there are no images of Jesus, and, and one of my favorite artists is Rembrandt. I'll use Rembrandt uh, for this. Uh, when Christianity evolves in this uh, sort of conflict within the empire, uh, it starts as a Jewish movement, uh, very accustomed to crucifixion. And let's see how things change. Uh, the early history I can't really go through, you can see it more in my essay, uh, but the real significant moment comes in the year 70 and the massive trauma, and again, I think linking trauma with identity hatred is very important, uh, occurred in the year 70 when the Roman legions destroyed the second temple. This was an existential moment of, of existence or non-existence for the Jewish world. Uh, has God abandoned us? Uh, are, are Jews, can we survive? It's out of this massive trauma and an estimated half a million Jews slaughtered uh, in this very small part of the world in a very uh, uh, small amount of time. That created the first crisis really within uh, Judaism at this time. Uh, you have here uh, the numbers estimated that were murdered by the Romans, uh, and thus you have a tremendous impactful event. Why this is significant is the emergence of two now separate traditions, both from Judaism, but will define themselves quite differently, both based on the trauma of the destruction of the temple. This, of course, will be uh, the gospel, the, the New Testament, or what will become known as Christianity, versus Talmudic Judaism that will emerge after the destruction of the temple. You're going to see here this image, a medieval image, of uh, Christians battling with Jews uh, over the truth, uh, the truth either being in the gospel or Talmud exclusively. In other words, Christians would argue that the Talmud was something created after the fall of the temple, after Jews had been rejected by God and therefore not valid, and only the gospel is. Let me unpack this just a little bit more. Father John Polakowski used to work at the Vatican, put it this way, by themselves, Christian anti-Judaism or opposition to Judaism and anti-Semitism did not generate the Shoah, the Holocaust, but they were the indispensable seedbeds for the Nazis. So if you, the other resource I provide for you is an anti-Semitic timeline as best I could. I don't believe history operates linearly. This is just simply a convenient reference point. But what I want to show you in that, if you, if you looked at uh, it, you would notice I've put in sort of at the bottom where the Gospels were written. And you're going to notice that all the Gospels, except for Mark, are all written after the fall of the, of the Second Temple. And Mark uh, is a very Jewish book, and it's, it's very much arguing and talking about the crisis in Judaism before the destruction of the Temple, uh, and then shifts a bit after the destruction of the Temple. What you'll see as the Gospels continue over the next number of generations, up into the last Gospel of John, is an increasing anti-Semitic tone. By the time you get to the Gospels of John, they are overtly anti-Semitic, painting Jews as the, the enemy, the devil. You know, what's going on here is a very human sort of definition of, of a religious movement, identifying itself as separate from and in opposition to the previous religion of Judaism. Another way to look at it would be this way, as I'm here at the Western Wall uh, of the Second Temple Ruins. Judeophobia will create over about five centuries into about the fifth century, this separate religious identity that would distinguish the Jews that followed the way or what will become Christianity and the Jews that remained within Pharisaic Judaism, Talmudic Judaism, uh, that would emerge as modern Judaism. This us versus them dynamic is what defines this first mutation. The source that will sanctify over the next really a thousand years this growing animosity and separation of identity would be the Catholic Church. I'm going to quote one of the church fathers. Uh, there are many of, of these uh, like this. And again, uh, this comes later. 
How dare Christians have the slightest intercourse with the Jews, those most miserable of all men. They are lustful, rapacious, greedy, perfidious bandits, pests of the universe. Shall I tell you of their plundering, their covetousness, the abandonment of the poor? These are all things, therefore, being claimed by the newly self-defining movement of Christianity that came out of Judaism. Now, the synagogue, just before I quote further, became the heartbeat of post-Second Temple Jewish life. It was sort of this uh, Talmudic uh, sort of reconnection to the Hebrew scriptures, centered with a rabbi, a well-learned person, in local synagogues to discuss and debate the meaning of Judaism after the destruction of the temple. But with this emergence of sort of Pharisaic synagogic Judaism, uh, Christianity saw a threat and an enemy. And so St. John Christosom continues, the synagogue is not only a brothel and a theater, a den of robbers, it's a lodging for wild beasts of demons. Their condition is not better than that of pigs. The Jews are the odious assassins of Christ and have underlined this as sort of a significant development. Uh, and Christians may never cease having vengeance against Jews for having killed Christ. Therefore, it's a moral act. Any decent Christian, of course, is therefore permitted to attack Jews. Let me talk about what he's mentioning here. The deicide myth, or the killing of God, is central to this emerging construct of us versus them. How much of it was sort of uh, adhered to in the early days of Christianity is very hard to decipher, but it's pretty clear by the 6th or 7th century, or especially the 11th century, it has become simply accepted as truth. And the truth was uh, here that Jesus wasn't really a Jew. Uh, and in fact, some medieval scholars go so far to argue that because uh, of the Virgin Mary, that she creates a brand new race uh, with Jesus. That never really becomes mainstream. That's more uh, on, the, on the fringe in the Middle Ages. But what's accepted is that it wasn't the Romans who killed Jesus by crucifixion, even though that had been Jewish experience in the Roman Empire, but that it was those Jews. Well, which Jews? There are, very, there are only two groups that survived the destruction of the Second Temple. And it's Pharisaic Judaism, which talked about finding truth through rabbis and synagogue. And we know that Paul himself was a Pharisee. We know that Jesus himself is most likely a Pharisee. They believe the same kind of things. But the Pharisees are the only surviving Jewish group. And therefore, as you go further in the Gospels, they become the villainous enemy because they're the only living Jews that had survived the destruction of the temple. So you're looking at here are Jews defined as those who weren't destroyed with the temple who somehow survived and created this new Judaism. And here they are killing Jesus. So therefore, the argument is pretty straightforward. Uh, there is no much such thing as Judaism anymore. The only Jews that exist after the destruction of the temple, because God abandoned them, are those that are employed to do nefarious things like kill Christians. And so here you see the Jew with the funny hat and the beard nailing Jesus to the cross. Totally removing Jesus' identity as a Jew. Totally kind of making Jews the enemy. But the funny hat comes from Christianity. In the year 1215, in the Fourth Lateran Council, the church decreed that Jews must wear these hats uh, and yellow badges, the same badges the church made prostitutes wear. So the yellow badge, we think, uh, most likely is connected to villainizing women uh, who wore very similar hats as witches in Christianity uh, as the evil uh, and immoral other. Of course, the myth now evolves and formed its new life with new generations, having killed Jesus and therefore rejected God's own Messiah, says Christianity, Jews are therefore condemned to wander the world. Uh, and thus, uh, that is their punishment, and Jews should never therefore have a state, should never be accepted, should never uh, fit in, and it is, their, uh, it is the punishment for their crime. This is a Renaissance image from Germany, Nuremberg. Uh, and so years have gone by from these early medieval tropes. And by the way, the first time we know that the deicide charge was given was by Bishop Alito in, in Turkey in the first century. Uh, but now it's kind of emerged here. And by the Renaissance, you have the Jew who's assimilated, uh, which makes him, of course, part of a conspiratorial foe. Uh, he's trying to look like us, stabbing Jesus on the cross. And it's the deicide myth 
uh, come to the fore. What's interesting for me is in this early Renaissance image, we know that in the Renaissance, size depicted importance. Uh, and therefore, one could argue that the Jewish community in their imagination created a tremendous threat to Christianity and Jews themselves, even though we know Jews by this point make up a very teeny percentage of the European population. From Germany again, uh, this trope emerges in a different direction. Uh, Christians believe uh, that, uh, Catholics believe, sorry, that the Eucharist, the body and blood of Christ, uh, is present at every mass uh, when consecrated. Uh, and if that's true, then therefore the Jews have failed in their mission uh, to kill Jesus. And so you have these medieval images from Germany, especially showing Jews breaking into the cathedral and stabbing the communion wafer. Uh, often it's accompanied with blood uh, flowing out. And this is the kind of dark medieval fear imagery that Mel Gibson would tap into uh, and very much believe uh, in, in his movie and his expressions of anti-Semitism. This is again the same trope. You're gonna see three Jews with their uh, hats adorned, nailing Jesus to the cross, uh, making a clear separation between them and us. Now we get to the 19th century uh, and we're looking at here that same trope, but it's now growing. So not only have the three Jews who are nailing Jesus down to the cross, you have in one of the first images I can find the depiction of the Romans uh, who are cowering in the background while somehow in the, in the middle here, three Jews kind of emerge from the earth as this powerful cabal who are kind of coordinating the whole thing. Well, nothing could be more a unhistoric, I guess, than this. Remember, the Romans killed an estimated half a million Jews uh, in that first century, and yet we're to believe in this really Christian construct that Romans are simply victims of this Jewish conspiracy uh, to kill Jesus. So in this early foundational work here, we're looking at anti-Semitism as a moral act uh, fixated on destroying a secret mythical Jewish power and a Jewish power that by God's own decree, the destruction of the temple shouldn't even exist. We're gonna sort of go to the Nazi world here. You're gonna see this, this is from uh, Julius Stryker's publishing house and you're gonna see it often in many different colors, pink, uh, brown, green, only because they were printing them so fast in Nazi Germany uh, that they were running out of ink. So here's a particular early version in green for school children. And what you see on the cover is now something quite different, not just Jews as religious enemies, but Jews as a racial enemy. The poisonous mushroom is the name of the book, for gift plots. And here the Jew uh, is, if you come near him or eat him or consume him, whatever, you will be poisoned as a mushroom. What was fascinating for me though, is someone with an Irish background, I thought, what do the Nazis have against leprechauns? Not to be facetious <laughs> here or, or flippant, uh, but had to dig a little deeper. Well, of course, what they're doing is fusing existing anti-Semitic beliefs with their own construct, which will be racism, that Jews aren't even human. By that, I mean this. It quickly becomes part of the Christian narrative that Jews are not only trying to kill Jesus, but they're doing it because their boss was Satan. And so now in that Jews boss is Satan, they must live in hell. Therefore, Jews all must have red hair because it's hot in hell. So you have this now fusion of Christian beliefs with this new set of racist beliefs. But to be fair, uh, you have the Star of David on the mushroom to tell Germans who haven't quite figured out yet that Jews aren't human, uh, that we're really talking about Jews here. This did not make a lot of sense for a lot of folks except for the extreme Nazis at the beginning. So when you open the book, it's pretty straightforward. Don't forget the Jews killed Christ. So they're tapping back into Christian religious identity and definition and not so much racial identity. But of course, too, they're tapping into something greater. You're talking about life. Perhaps this family lost their uh, father, husband in the First World War. There will be, of course, the surrogate father who will guide the family forward. You see the, the baby at the foot of the cross who can only live, right, if Christianity thrives. And the only way for that to happen, of course, is to destroy the poison, the poisonous mushroom. And so the moral reminder is here, as it had existed in Christianity for a thousand years, when you see a cross, think of the horrible murder 
by the Jews on Golgotha. This is from Der Sturmer, 1939, sort of the Nazi uh, extremist rag uh, of anti-Semitism anti here of crucifixion, where now they've gone a step further. They've created the Jewish just kind of stereotype here that comes from Christianity. And now it's the Aryan race that's being crucified. And therefore now the Aryans themselves are Christ-like. It's no mistake that Hitler would often in his early speeches uh, self-identify as the Messiah as the new Jesus come to Germany to resurrect it. All these are things that would resonate amongst Christianity. Going back to the Middle Ages now, kind of developing another uh, trope here. And that is the concept of supersessionism, that Christianity comes to understand itself as having replaced Judaism. And so the imagery to teach us, of course, in a pre-literate society were either statues or stained glass window and I'm going to give you uh, two images from the same cathedral here and have you ponder a minute, which one do you think represents the Jew or she's known as synagogue, and which one represents the church known as uh, ecclesia or ecclesia. And if you look at that carefully, I don't think it'll take too long to figure out because you are now taking the medieval peasant test, which one is bad and which one is good. So on the right hand side is synagogue, a woman riding a donkey with a sword coming from God himself in heaven, stabbing her in the head as the crown of leadership. She was once the chosen people falls off. And the other interesting thing here is a staff that would have had a flag on it. She was sort of the flag bearer of God, broken. So therefore no longer sanctified by God. On the other side though, is now uh, Ecclesia. And Ecclesia is the woman who is now ordained from heaven with the crown that has been displaced from Judaism, holding now its uh, flag of leadership, if you would, which is symbolized by the Eucharist, the body of Christ, every mass that would, would become present again. And she, of course, rides on a lion. And you'll notice there's a falcon and others. These are the four gospels. Each animal represents one of the four gospels. So straightforward you would walk in and you would see which one do i want to belong to which one is wrong and evil uh as one of my uh, high school kids pointed out once they said didn't they remember that jesus came into jerusalem on a donkey <laughs> right and i thought oh good perception but for this particular image the donkey is the jackass uh and therefore it's a reference in a way to the talmud uh versus the gospels this is from verb in germany uh in uh the renaissance or actually late middle ages other interesting depiction here of the goat's head uh, was a reference, of course, to the devil, to Satan. The other thing that I find really interesting, this is one of the last images that we have, there are many of them, of synagogue, is what she's wearing. If you can see carefully here, she is wearing a blindfold that is tied with a huge knot in the back of her head. I think this is really significant. On one level, it's because it's a biblical reference of when people would realize Jesus was the Messiah, the veil would fall off their face and they would be saved. In this case, so that veil isn't moving. It is thick, it is tied. The question is who tied it and what does that mean? So I'm gonna go back to an earlier depiction, again, Strasbourg here, of synagogue and Ecclesia, and I've put them on the same side, right versus left, this time a statue. And these all still exist in medieval cathedrals and churches. Same symbols being used here, uh, Ecclesia on the left with the staff of leadership, the Eucharist, and the crown ordained by heaven as the new chosen people, the new Israel, the New Testament. On the right hand side, you have synagogue, but I want you to notice how different she looks than the previous one. And I'll bring that back up in a, in a minute. Same symbols, the broken staff leaning against her shoulder. She's holding the Ten Commandments, which is a common trope of the, the, the well, I won't get into that uh, construct. But I want you to notice and ask, is she or is she not wearing a blindfold? So this particular image of synagogue was 13th century. The other one I showed you was 15th century, so 200 years later. If you look very carefully at synagogue on the right, you're going to see she is indeed wearing a blindfold, but it's paper thin. In fact, it's not even tied. It's loosely hanging from her ears. And in fact, synagogue herself is actually beautiful. What's the inference? Well, the inference is theological. 
that if we can expose Jews to the truth, to Jesus, the blindfold will fall off, they can be rescued and treated as brothers and sisters once they convert. Well, in that Jews stuck to their own beliefs and did not convert, over the next 200 years, they become villainized. And now, 200 years later, when you now see the blindfold, it's now tied. And who tied it? Synagogue herself, who is purposely rejecting the gift you're offering her. And therefore, rather than force conversion, which would be on the perpetrator, oh no, the rejection of being saved is now on the Jew. And from this comes Jewish stereotypes. Jews are stubborn. They resist. Uh, they don't see the truth. Jews are blind to their own Messiah, Christians would argue. Uh, and this is a movement within the Christianity that still exists. I heard of a horrible story of, of, of people recognizing, um, well, I'm trying to, how, how controversial to get, um, basically baptizing Jews who died in the Holocaust uh, posthumously, therefore doing them a favor because now becoming Christian, they can be saved. What that, of course, translates to is that in Auschwitz, the people who died were all Christians. Uh, so this is where this actually leads to in our current uh, world. Church leaders thought that Jews had abandoned their role in the divine plan, which is why God had rejected them, and that's the crisis of first century Judaism. But how does this play out in Germany? Um, I was struck by this particular image propaganda that many of us have seen from Bavaria, so the Catholic region of Germany, and the translation Long Live Germany here, uh, is very much a Catholic trope. You have the Holy Spirit descending from heaven, anointing Hitler as he would proclaim himself as the Messiah to resurrect the country in a very male movement. The swastika itself uh, is, before Hitler, seen as a Christian good luck symbol. You would see it all over Europe. And what it is, it's the Christian cross with the ends tip, so the luck doesn't run out. Uh, and so good luck. But Hitler is now put on his edge, and he's made us his Nazi symbol. But I think this image taps into something that I've been talking about. He's holding a staff of leadership. That new leadership is the Christian cross, that he, the Messiah, is almost holding. Well, let me superimpose one over the other. Does it look familiar? And so I think what the Nazis are doing here is consciously tapping into pre-existing anti-Semitic belief, painting themselves as the sort of, uh, uh, as the saviors and resurrectors of this particular belief and a mission moving forward to save the world from Jews. Going to France, uh, sorry, a tourist photograph that I took um, before Notre Dame caught on fire. Uh, you'll see here the three entrances of the cathedral, but you're gonna notice in the framing middle entrance, uh, two statues that still exist today, even after the fire. And if you look carefully at them, you're going to notice who they are. It's synagogue and Ecclesia. Wow. So even though the church, and we'll talk about this in a moment, has rejected all of this as untruth and uh, medieval superstition, it's still in all these churches as a teaching uh, moment. But here comes the quiz for you, uh, and that is the synagogue you see on the right, you can date medieval cathedrals by its synagogue. Now, I've already told you that later synagogues were vicious. They, they looked mean. They had heavy um, uh, eye coverings, sometimes swords in their heads, that kind of thing. And earlier synagogues looked beautiful, dainty, because Jews could still be converted. So when you look at this particular synagogue, she's wearing a bonnet. She's standing rather beautifully. You can barely see us if she has a, has a blindfold on or not, which tells you that Notre Dame is a very early medieval cathedral. And over time, when Jews wouldn't convert, you would see much different synagogue. So you can literally date a cathedral by its synagogue. How this plays out into the 20th century, uh, uh, this is from a collection a friend of mine has of anti-Semitic stuff. Uh, this was from a Catholic uh, end of the year autograph book, School Day Memories. Uh, it's a puffy book. It's about yay big. Uh, and in it, it's from a Catholic school in Long Island the Holy Ghost School. Uh, it still exists today as the Holy Spirit School in Long Island, and this was the memory book of eighth grader Roseanne McNeil, a good Irish Catholic girl. The date to me is stunning, June 22, 1941. That's the invasion of the Soviet Union 
and the fundamental unleashing of the Holocaust. Now, I'm not going to blame Roseanne McNeil, an eighth grader with her memory book in a Catholic school in New York City for the Holocaust. But what I want to point out, though, is how this idea about Jews was now endemic in Catholic teaching. When you go through this book, you come across different signatures of her friends wishing her well, of different nuns, you know, blessing her and wishing her well. And then I came across this page. Roses are red, violets are blue. When you get married, don't marry a Jew. So on one level, one shouldn't be surprised. But on the other level, this is, of course, eight years into Nazism that has been reporting attacks on Jews in the New York Times and other main publications pretty consistently. And yet, inside her education, never marry a Jew that's considered an evil thing. Okay, that's one way to look at how this becomes endemic. It was works like this that allowed Sister Rose Thering, a wonderful Catholic nun in the 1950s, to look at Catholic teaching and saying, oh my goodness, we may have contributed to the Holocaust. Uh, and thus Christianity had a real soul searching moment thanks to this one nun who was looking at this catechism. Now, another collection from the exact same time period shifts this a little bit. This is someone who knew better. This is a military attache uh, in London. Uh, so he's the American military attache uh, before America's in the war. And his job, of course, is to collect intelligence and report back to Washington. He is from Massachusetts. His name is Kennedy, another Irish Catholic. And he's writing letters back home to his wife in Massachusetts. Uh, he's sending numerous letters each week. And I suspect because he's afraid that uh, the U-boats will sh uh, sink some of the ships carrying his letters home to his beloved wife. So he's writing numerous letters. A letter that struck me, these were uh, two letters written in the same week. They are totally different letters with the exception of one paragraph that he felt essential to convey to his wife back home in Massachusetts. And he writes in the first letter, I am glad the clippings reached you. Did you get uh, the, the about the London fires? He's probably talking about the Blitz. I am sending few papers to help you pass the time and so on and so forth. And then he gets to, after a few months, I got fed up with the Jews in the Cumberland Hotel. Remember this is 1941 now. Uh, and I moved to another one, the one Wilkie's at. Uh, it is very uh, convenient and it's good to get away from this Palestine atmosphere of those Jews. Within the week, he writes an entirely different letter except for this now abrogated paragraph to his wife. Did I tell you I moved out of the Jewish hotel? So apparently that was very important for him to convey back to his wife. Why, what's the context here? So I began to research this particular hotel this hotel ended up being a refugee hotel for German Jews escaping the Reich. And uh, this may have been a consequence of the kind of transport that took place after Kristallnacht. In other words, these weren't just any Jews he was with at the, at the Cumberland Hotel, but Jews who were telling horrific stories about what was happening to them in Nazi Germany. And so he's reassuring his wife, don't worry, no matter what the Jews tell me, I'm not going to be swayed. I still will be a decent Catholic. Why is it that he's so afraid to listen to those stories, perhaps? And I'm assuming here, of course. I think it's the second mutation that comes in. So the first mutation was creating them as religious enemies, and we had to take a long time to try to construct that. And now we simply just graduate. Uh, so we go from synagogue ecclesia, that maybe Jews can be converted, to that is no longer working. And so that trope begins to disappear. It'll always be there, but it begins to disappear. In the 11th century, it shifts into the Jews now being sort of demonic rejectors of Christianity, which is something a little, I guess, a step up. And Christians thought about Jews more and more now as a foe, not one to be converted, but one to either uh, isolate or even annihilate. This is the last image I could find, and I could be wrong, but the last one I could find of synagogue and ecclesia, and it's quite disturbing. Again, here in Erfurt, uh, here in the 15th century, so into the Renaissance, not yet perhaps in Germany, but uh, you have on the left, Ecclesia, and on the right, Synagoga, almost tilting in mortal and equal combat for survival at a time where Jews are a teeny minority in Europe. Uh, and there was no threat, of course, to Christianity whatsoever. When you get to this point, 
that trope doesn't work anymore, and thus they shift into something quite different. The story of Jews being our perpetual enemy employed by a demonic force is what still has great traction in our modern thought today. Where does this come from? What was the trauma? Because I think trauma is what creates these constructs. Uh, I think it's the Crusades. And uh, for those who look at any map like this of the Crusades, you would just think that the good Christian knights went across Europe to the Holy Land to free Jerusalem from the evil Muslims. But of course, we know it's not really what happened. Uh, the medieval knights, believing that Jews were a conspiratorial foe of the devil, first went to the Rhine River Valley, where 30,000 Jews lived, and slaughtered them before they ever went en route to the Middle East. What's going on here? Well, we are protectors of our families. We are leaving them abandoned. Jews will probably come attack our families while we're gone. So we must preemptively strike them before they strike us. This idea of uh, preventative attacks is really, I think, the, the core makeup of modern day anti-Semitism. But what is the trauma? When you're a knight on horseback or on foot and you're killing women and children at the point of a sword, that is highly, highly traumatic. And at the end, I think one has to in their mind justify it. And so the justification I gave you, I think almost comes after the killing where we had to do this or else. So this justification of these acts uh, are seen as moral. Uh, preceding the Crusades, by the ninth century on Good Friday, uh, a good Christian would punch a Jew in the face. Uh, why Good Friday? Well, the most dangerous time for a Jew to be alive in medieval Europe was uh, Lent, uh, leading into Holy Week, uh, when Jesus would die on the cross and then resurrect at Easter. Well, if they believed Jews were out to kill Jesus, they saw this as sort of Jews' last chance to get at Jesus. And so you would go through this horrible time where um, you would have Good Friday, you would have the sermons about how Jews did this, you would every four years in places like Germany have passion plays where a lot more was added. You'd have an actor dying on the cross and the traumatized crowd seeing their beloved Jesus die would be told, remember who did this. And the mob would be unleashed on Jewish neighborhoods and Jews would learn every Good Friday to uh, have oil boiling next to the window uh, to fight off the mobs. And then of course, Easter would come and Jesus would be resurrected and all the violence would stop. And indeed, Christians would then go to Jewish neighborhoods that they had destroyed only days earlier and rebuild it and ask for forgiveness. Uh, and so the old expression was, uh, they love me on Friday, try to kill me on Saturday, and then love me again on Tuesday. Uh, became sort of a, a norm of Jewish life in the Middle Ages. Uh, I thought this was, by the way, a medieval trope until I was reading a, uh, uh, a story of a shtetl in Eastern Europe. And in the 1920s, they're talking about walking up to Jews and punching them in the face on Good Friday. Uh, so we have many Jews slaughtered before the first, first Crusades uh, leave Europe, especially in the Rhine River Valley, uh, to protect, they think, uh, loved ones from the Jewish conspiracy. Now it becomes part of Christianity. Again, this is a Bible, 13th century Bible in France, uh, illustrating the massacre of Jews as a moral act. Jesus uh, is in heaven and on earth, applauding the deed done by the knights who are slaughtering the Jews to protect themselves and create a safe moral world. But when it's in the Bible, uh, one could therefore infer it's moral. Images like this begin to appear after the first crusades. You have here Jews being burned uh, in the cauldron. The cauldron itself says Judah or Jew. And the Jew is wearing the same hat the church put on prostitutes and women and witches uh, as they are burning in hell where they're living with the devil with their red hair. When you get to the early Renaissance here, a painting by Giotto uh, in Italy, uh, you have here the devil himself going through some sort of metamorphosis. On the left-hand side is sort of this black creature. Well, in the early depictions in the Bible of the devil, he's a fallen angel. But now he's a demonic beast. And if you even watch uh, Disney's depiction of the monster, right, coming out, this becomes the image of the devil that is pretty normal. It's also interesting the devil is black. Uh, in German Bibles, uh, evil is always associated with black. Uh, that's another topic for a different time. But here the devil pushes Judas into betraying Jesus for money. 
Uh, Judas himself, uh, interesting character. Is that a plural version of all Jews? There was all kinds of theological discussions about what that might mean. But the devil has changed. And at some point, the image of who the devil is and who the Jew is at one point then becomes the same image. That the Jew themselves are non-human devils. So you have this sort of uh, early uh, 21st century depiction of uh, Eros Sharon uh, in the Shabbat Shatila camps, uh, but he's a devil, and the menorah itself is sort of the standard of the devil uh, here in hell. From this comes the blood libel, the idea of ritual murder, that Jews uh, murder Christian children, especially during uh, Lent, uh, for their blood to make matzo bread. All of this is nonsensical, of course, and offensive. Uh, but here, here you have, uh, it begins, by the way, in England, Norwich, England, uh, but here you have a fresco uh, in a Polish church uh, that was still there the last time I checked, uh, I could be wrong, uh, about the Jews gathering around to drain the blood of a child who is depicted in a very Christ-like way. So these images of Jews now as real enemies, uh, draining the blood of our children to make matzo bread, was actionable by many decent Christians who are living in fear, trying to live the good life, and you see the bodies all around the bottom here. What's fascinating for me is, I may be lied to a little bit here, this is not a medieval image. I'll come back to what it is. Here's a medieval image on the right. You have here uh, the Jews uh, who are now on the bottom panel suckling from a pig as if it's its mother, uh, eating its excrement, that's the second Jew, with the devil pushing them to do it, wearing that yellow badge. A lot of stuff going on here. Somehow now you're implying Jews aren't even human, that their parents are pigs. Uh, these are, of course, justifications for slaughter. And above, on the image, you have the child laid out like Christ on the cross as a reminder that Jews killed Christ. Oh, by the way, the image on the left does not come from medieval Christianity. Of course, it comes from Nazi Germany. This from Der Sturmer, and again, making the case to Christian Germans to remember what they had been taught in schools for a thousand plus years. I think the devil now being uh, connected here with the pig is another kind of evolution in this thinking of, of creating them as the devil, because it leads us right to Martin Luther. Martin Luther here, and by the way, we're not going to try to make a, a linear connection to medieval theorists and thinkers to modern day crimes. Uh, history doesn't work that way, but certainly inspires people to think about certain things when they want to. This is a church in Wittenberg, and there's a currently a very hot debate going on about should we remove this image from the Wittenberg church where Luther was a pastor, a pastor, I believe. Anyway, it shows the same thing. The Judensau, the Jew pig, with Jews suckling from it eating its excrement, and this is a religiously uh, sanctioned image of the Jew. I throw that away because I just can't stand it. Uh, so uh, we then go to the modern depiction of this. Here in Ramadan 2005, and by the way, if you don't know the site Memory, uh, Middle Eastern Media Research Institute, they will take what is uh, often in Arabic from extremist groups uh, that become mainstream and translate it to English so you see what's going on. And in this particular mini-series that was shown during Ramadan, uh, you have the Jewish uncle uh, calling his nephew for, I forgot what the celebration was, but anyway, he locks him in the basement and literally goes down and slits his throat as the blood goes all over. And this was shown in prime time. What's fascinating for me is there's nothing in Islam that has any references to blood libel at all. This comes from medieval Christianity. But medieval Christianity, you see, was dropped into the Middle East by French Catholic priests in the 19th century. And so what you're going to see is all this stuff from these extremists in the Middle East that has nothing to do with Islam, but has lots to do with how Christianity formulated these images uh, in, the Middle, in the Middle Ages. Again, from Syria, uh, here where many Nazis showed up after the war, uh, you have the same kind of imagery uh, of, of Jews who would therefore be seen as Israelis. Uh, so these tropes, again, were imported to the Middle East, really grafted onto, and there was pre-existing anti-Semitism in Islam, but this kind of trope and expression is grafted onto it by Catholic priests in the 19th century. 
And I think the last trauma before we kind of wrap this up uh, quickly now, Leanne, I get some questions here, is the other major trauma of the Middle Ages that makes this all seem real and uh, believable is the Black Death. And when the Black Death strikes, we don't have to talk about, well, yeah, we can do this easily, right? How did the Black Death uh, still have imports to us, importance to us? I can start off by doing the nursery rhyme. Ring around the rosy, pocket full of posy. And all of you in your head are finishing off what I was just starting. Well, that's a medieval song, of course, about the Black Death. And ring around the rosy was the first signs of the, in the, in the glands of the disease. Uh, it used to be uh, a pocket full of posies was your amulets to ward off the disease. And the actual first expression was a tissue, a tissue, a sneeze, a sneeze, and then we all fall down dead. Now, as kids, you probably played that. You all thought it was funny. Um, and no one ever remembers being taught it. It was just part of the culture out of the trauma of the 14th century. So for the traumatized survivors trying to put meaning to their lives in a devastated world, everything they believed has now changed. You have images here like on the left. The Jew is behind all of this. Even though Jews died at almost relatively same uh, levels of, of death as others, in places where they didn't, it's because of cleanliness. But here you have the Jew who looks like a wealthy merchant dropping something into a well. It's poison. And out of the poison is the devil who has now been conjured up by the Jew. Uh, and of course, so we don't forget, there's a deicide charge. They've been doing this forever and you can't trust the Jews. And then of course, out of that trauma comes identity and fear needing to be expressed. And you have here the burning of Jews. So, and this is of course from uh, Flanders, uh, as a moral, decent, necessary act. So by the time you get to Auschwitz, this stuff has already existed in the imagination of Christians in Europe. Here, the burning of Jews in Nuremberg in the 15th century as a decent moral act to save the world from the virus of Judaism. Which leads to this one, which is really important, of course, today, the contagion myth. Uh, and that will come out of later 19th century constructs about Jews. This is from a Nazi film, the Ayuda, which talks about Jews as rats. If you've ever seen this, Jews are coming out of the sewers to spread their disease, and it's our duty to exterminate them. So clearly you have racism here. In fact, uh, dehumanization on a large scale. On the right-hand side, you have uh, the, the, the Jewish peril. This is uh, uh, given to people in wartime France and Poland, talking about Jews as insects, as lice that must be exterminated. And now we're into dehumanization, which and conspiracy, of course, which allows for extermination. How does that play out today? Uh, one in five Britons believe that Jews created COVID-19 for economic or political gain. And here's a, an extremist cartoon uh, depicting the same kind of stuff about COVID. The real pay, uh, plague here, this is from Ohio. Uh, this is, uh, of course, the white nationalist uh, parade using the Israeli flag to bring back the uh, contagion myth and Jews as rats. Uh, and of course, this is in Ohio. This is from a Christian minister from Florida this year. God's dealing with people who oppose his son, Jesus Christ, dealing with the forces of the Antichrist. Uh, there is a plague moving among the earth right now and the people that are going into the synagogue and are coming out of it with the virus, right? So it's that same, John Christostom from the synagogue through the Black Death conspiracy theory, and here being expressed by a far right conspiracy theorist who's uh, also a pastor. Deborah Lipstadt, who, uh, of course, as you might remember from the Irving trial, uh, talks about all of these things that begin with Jews never end with Jews. And in fact, if you have been watching, because all of us were terrified when COVID 19 came out, because we knew through history, what was about to happen. But now the Chinese have been designated as the contagion myth. Uh, and now you'll have vicious uh, racist tracks that will sort of take this and morph it into uh, anti-Asian rhetoric uh, in the same sort of conspiratorial ways. So whatever starts with the Jews doesn't end there and of course becomes lethal for democracy and for freedom and human rights. Um, I'm ending this part only as a personal reflection. This became very difficult for me, once raised in a Catholic tradition, 
uh, I came to this particular uh, moment where discovering prayer books from the 14th century became a disturbing exercise. So yeah, I'm gonna share with you uh, a prayer book, Post Black Death, of good Christians trying to learn how to be decent human beings. And to summarize the story, the story was, uh, in many of these prayer books, uh, was that uh, a little Jewish boy is playing with his friends and it's a Sunday and uh, they're playing in the street, maybe some game, we'll pretend it's soccer. And then the church bell rings and calls them all to mass. Some reading the prayer book or summarizing the prayer book. They bring their Jewish friend to church. They're all buddies. The Jewish kid goes in, he goes to the whole mass. And indeed in the prayer book, the Jewish boy actually consumes communion, which indeed of course would convert him and save him. Well, the story continues that they come back out of church, they start playing again, and the Jewish kid's father calls him out. Where have you been? And the son comes home. And in the prayer book, father says, where have you been, my son? And the son says, dad, I had a great morning. I went with my friends to mass. And in the prayer book, the Jewish father gets very nervous. And then he asked, what did you do there? And the son said, I even had communion, dad. And in the prayer book, the father picks up his child and throws him into the fire. In later versions, uh, there's actual stories of Mary who descends from heaven, removes the Jewish child from the furnace, and then throws the father in. When I think of Auschwitz and the burning children of Auschwitz, that Christendom, many raised in a Christian tradition did, and through Jewish children and fathers into fires, it becomes a very difficult moment of reckoning for me and my own tradition. Burning becomes a theme here in late Middle Ages. Uh, here you have Dominican monks, I'm sorry, these are Benedictine monks who are burning books they're burning the Talmud. And again, they're not burning the Old Testament they're, or Hebrew scriptures, they're burning the Talmud, something created after the fall of the temple, therefore from demonic sources. Book burning, throwing Jews into the ovens, we're all looking here at the precourses of Nazi Germany. Again, not a direct line because nothing is set in stone. There are alternatives and many people fought all this nonsense. But Luther, of course, is true as a rich source. The Nazis, of course, would use them as well. And he would write, burn all their synagogues, destroy Jewish dwellings, confiscate their holy books, forbid rabbis to teach or travel. You're looking at Nazi policy. Forbid Jews to charge interest on loans to non-Jews and confiscate property and so on and so forth. And then he gets to uh, force Jews to physical labor, expel the Jews from their provinces. All this, of course, is what decent Christians will do as moral human beings. Well, it's no coincidence that on Luther's birthday, Kristallnacht happened, where they burned the synagogues. That actually was more uh, coincidence than planning. Uh, but the Nazis took advantage of it quickly by using Luther, uh, the great writer of Christianity, uh, to justify their actions. It wasn't until 1994 that the American Lutheran Church came out and revoked Luther's teachings on Jews as human error. And of course, we're at least 60 years too late. The Catholic Church, and again, this last, this is the last thing that, that Nostra Aetate, the Great Church Council of 1965, uh, concluded, uh, not in our time, uh, hatred of Jews. And this is because of Sister Rose Thering, uh, the, the nun who kept pressing the cardinals, the males who were rejecting her, to deal with what was in uh, the holy books and the catechism. And so the church made a statement that neither all Jews uh, at that time or Jews today can be charged with deicide. It's a start, uh, but all that stuff is still in the gospels and uh, still has to be reckoned with. But by and large, Christians today, mainstream Christians will reject the deicide charge and will see Jews more likely as brothers and sisters than as enemies and criminals. But the stuff is still there. This is from an Austrian church uh, and it shows, and often you'll have, by the way, uh, in European churches, you'll have a sarcophagus, a glass sarcophagus, and the corpse of a boy there from the Middle Ages uh, with a sign saying, remember the Jews did this. So this stuff is still very much part of Christian expression in Europe. We're gonna, the last bit here is, and I'm conscious of time here, uh, is relatively quick because laying the groundwork is, is hard, uh, but standing outside of Birkenau, uh, I want us to see how ideology functions, that these traditions develop to justify behavior. And I think that behavior came out of trauma. 
and the behavior itself acting upon it then reinforces the need to have the ideology. So this becomes a symbiotic kind of cycle. Individuals are not just shaped by the group, they shape the group and its behavior and its justifications as well. So this is of course a relational kind of thing, not a brainwashing kind of thing. Evil is unspectacular and always human. The third mutation I'm gonna do, I think in a slide or two, I forget how quickly I do this because I now wanna to get to the Q and A, where you've gone from, and by the way, remember, the other viruses are still active. They've just had a temporary antidote. In the first case, it wasn't really working anymore. Jews weren't being converted. We've gone to demonic Judaism, uh, Jews as religious enemies and devils. Well, that gets mitigated by the enlightenment. And when you go through the uh, French and American revolutions and the enlightenment, that rejects religious teachings as superstitious. And now is saying, no, you must reprove everything through science and logic. The second mutation loses some of its force. So a third mutation comes out of this virus, uh, which comes in the 19th century. And this is the one that's lethal. Not that the previous ones weren't lethal because there were mass murders and conversions and all that, but this one is genocidal. So let's get to the logic of this third mutation uh, as the life continues. Here you have two images, one from France uh, pre-World War I and one from Germany on the eve of World War II both depicting similar themes. Uh, we have here the Dreyfus case in France, which we won't spend time on here, but the Jew Dreyfus, the only Jew on the general staff, is accused of being a traitor, but notice how he's not human. He becomes a serpent. You have two things there, right? You have the, the non-human depiction, a serpent, but serpent, of course, is a symbol of Christianity of the devil. So these things are all fusing together in new expression. Or here, uh, the octopus is squeezing the life out of the world, and these are the Jews. Uh, but if you go to medieval imagery, you're gonna see similar images of the communion wafer being squeezed until the blood comes out. So they're tapping into Christian expression and tropes, but giving it its own racist, racist bent that these aren't even the actions of human beings. What other sources of trauma that would make people construct a new anti-Semitism and believe in it as a moral thing? Well, I, I think you have to start, of course, with uh, the Enlightenment, which I mentioned, which disempowered this idea of religion as an identifier. And then came the Industrial Revolution. And you have literally almost overnight entire revolutionary changes in life as agrarian farmers are thrown into overpopulated and polluted and dying cities. Uh, and in this horrible trauma, you'll have great authors, Victor Hugo, uh, uh, from England, of course, you'll have Scrooge talking about this. Uh, but for the average person going through this kind of displacement in their life, they had to figure out why it was going on and give meaning to it. The sources that would allow this to become mainstream would be the Enlightenment, would be imperialism as European countries began to conquer brown and black races. They had to justify that. And of course, now racism will become part and parcel of any kind of expression of empire. Nationalism, who and who does not belong to the nation is new uh, in European thinking, social Darwinism and racism. The concept of anti-Semitism minus the hyphen was by Wilhelm Marr in 1879. It was explicitly to stop Jewish assimilation, intermarriage, uh, because it was getting very hard to tell who was a Jew and who was not. And from this, he would then go on to say, because Jews aren't really human. It's no longer a religious argument. It's not about morals. It's about nature and science, that Jews are naturally inclined to go after you and destroy your families. And so we don't use the hyphen in Semitism because Semites are a language grouping. And if you say you're anti-Semites, that means you're against language groupings. That would include Arab tribes in the Middle East. That's not Mars' intention at all. And in fact, deniers will often use the hyphen to say that we ourselves are victims here of this hatred, but it's not the case. This is a term that's created as hatred of Jews, but in a scientific and reasonable expression. Nature itself is a battlefield. This is no longer about morality. Is it right or wrong? Can Jews be converted or not? No, by social Darwinistic terms, it's the survival of the fittest. 
and fit people must demonstrate their ability and willingness to survive. Uh, so that's just natural evolution. What about the Syriac cabal? This idea that Jews have conspired to fill Christ, a religious construct? It becomes the protocols of the elders of Zion. This is a fraud published in Russia. Again, what's going on in Russia, 1902 and three up to 05, the first Russian revolution that's about to topple the czar. Nicholas was a devout anti-Semite. And so he hired his uh, secret police to create some kind of book that would make people hate Jews and not him. It's typical European leader behavior. And so they grab all these sort of penny dreadfuls from Europe, put it all together in a brand new story. And they talk about how Jews secretly meet uh, in a Prague cemetery and they have certain things they do to try to destroy the whole world. I don't like to use the word uh, forgery, which people often use to describe the protocols, because forgery implies that it's copying something that was legit. There's nothing legit here. It's all made up. Uh, it's a fraud. But the fraud becomes the new Bible, if you would, of anti-Semitism, justifying behavior. The themes of the protocols, we won't do all of them, but here's what they are arguing, that Jews created alcoholism. Uh, after all, they love wine, and once people get drunk, uh, they can then uh, seduce them and create a, a race of inferior people. Uh, they did all the world wars. This was the way for Jews to behind the scenes, that's what the Nazis will tap into, uh, to create war, to kill all uh, non-Jewish people so they can take over the world. Uh, universal suffrage, giving the women the right to vote, is part of a Jewish plot to uh, destroy uh, white males, and on and on it goes. So the protocols rapidly leave Russia and get, gain great traction in places looking for ways to hate Jews that aren't religious anymore, but have a pseudoscientific basis to them. This is The International Jew, published in 1920 in the United States. Why the US? In the Russian Civil War, many of the white Russians pro czarist forces had had to flee the country. Many of them show up in Paris, many come to the US, and they carry with them this book. By the way, who published this book in America in 1920 talking about this Jewish conspiracy? Anybody recognize who it is? It's Henry Ford. Henry Ford is one of Hitler's heroes. In fact, Ford's picture is in Hitler's office for much of the war. And in this book, he talks about how the Jews control industry, the media, and must be dealt with. This is the Nazi edition of the protocols. So this thing has great traction. In fact, uh, in Mein Kampf, Hitler uh, references both Henry Ford and the international Jew uh, as his justification as to what he wants to do. These are other editions of it. You're going to see it all throughout Europe, needing to have some kind of new Bible. France, 1934, the Pyramid of the uh, and through all the way to the right, you'll see Egypt. This is, uh, from all accounts, the second or third best-selling book in the Middle East right now. You can buy any bookstores. Amazon sells it. In fact, Walmart was selling it up until recently. I'm not sure if they've changed that or not online, uh, but it's there. Uh, and of course, this will sanctify much of the violence and killing. So this is where I rapidly kind of came to this sort of conclusion now uh, about what I was doing. And uh, I have here sort of, uh, they call these, I think, wordles of some of the things that I brought up uh, already, some I haven't uh, given time. Uh, but I'm curious that we all take a breath right now, and I hit a lot of, throwing a lot of stuff your way to find out what's on your mind. Uh, I framed it really with four questions that I started this off with but you may have better and other ways to raise questions. So I'm gonna stop talking now for a bit and uh, see what kind of questions this has raised for you and then uh, questions about how to use it in a classroom as well. And what's our time we have? Okay, so we have 15 minutes anyway. And so uh, Ron, go ahead. I have a question. I have a question, okay. Go ahead, yes. Can I ask a question? Sure. Okay. Can I ask a question? Please do. Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's Carol Marvin. I just, um, I'm sorry I had a doctor's appointment. I had to go back and forth over these uh, Zoom meetings, but um, the new phenomenon of QAnon, and, and it's yeah. now called pedophilia, which is, of course, abhorrent and, uh, you know, 
Epps, Jeffrey Epstein doesn't help the case, but isn't that a new way of a uh, 2020 way of saying, talking about this ancient uh, need for, that Jews have to kill uh, children? I mean, it's now disguised in Ted Soros or Hollywood and other other memes that really Jew is behind it. And it's so, so it's disguised, but when but we, you know, I think that, that uh, I heard the other day someone claiming there were three to five million of these QAnon people, tens of the thousands of these cells. It's horrifying to think. It's a, that this it's a wonderful question and I thank you for it so much. Um, I'll, I'll answer it briefly and then we'll come back at the end and talk about sort of the modern constructs here. But you're exactly right. This is something that is now becoming more mainstream. It's from the fringe. The third mutation that I was talking about that was so racistly based in the conspiracy stuff, of course, will lose a lot of its momentum after the Holocaust with Never Again and the Catholic Church going through its Nostra Aetate and other churches. And so it's still there and, of course, will come up. Uh, but now they need a new mutation. And that new mutation really is, uh, by and large, although not confined to, uh, expressions of conspiracy and anti-Israel. And so QAnon becomes, if you would, the new protocols, uh, and it finds its niche. What's disturbing for me is that we have political leaders in this country that are saying it's a very decent thing uh, and not rejecting it. And so that becomes very scary. So um, mm -hmm. I would say your perception is spot on. Thank you. So anything surprising for folks, uh, things that you're kind of wrestling with and trying to figure out uh, what needs to be clarified, uh, themes that might be important, how to bring it up in a classroom. Did it challenge anything that you thought you knew? Often I'm talking to a non-Jewish audience, so uh, often they uh, are, are surprised by what I was telling them. Hi, do you mind if I speak without the video on? Sure. Oh, thank you. I have a black eye from a, a, a hiking fall, so it's a little embarrassing. Um, so my name is Jen Ramirez, and I am an uh, English as a second language teacher. I've taught in public schools, and um, I've also taught at a program that used to um, be at Roger Williams. Um, it was an English language service program where the majority, overwhelming majority of our students were from Saudi Arabia. So for me, that was... Um, really interesting and challenging at the same time because of their culture um, and their um, anti-Israel, anti-Semitic type of thinking. And since college, I've studied a lot about Jewish history, um, Yiddish culture, Holocaust. Um, I'm just kind of like a, I'm the opposite of an anti-Semite. I've just glorified Jewish culture and history. So I'm, I'm a big fan and so for me, it was very passionate trying to, when things would come up that had to do with Jewish people and, and my Saudi students, they were very limited in their dealings with Jew. I mean, they came and met Jews for the first time here in America. So there was still so much anti-Semitism and hate against Israel. And I would try to incorporate lessons from um, anti-Semitism, the early roots. And you've taught me so much more. I thought I knew a lot about um, early, early anti-Semitism, and, and I didn't until today, and I thank you for that. But um, I think what helped me to help those um, Saudi students was also um, getting Jewish students from the university and having them do talks. And also one remarkable thing I think I did was uh, we have a synagogue in Bristol. It's a, I don't know if you know, it's... Um, very old little synagogue run by a lay, not a rabbi, a lay person. And I reached out to this person and um, he opened it up for us. So for the first time in their lives, my Saudi Muslim students um, were able to go into a synagogue and to listen and to have that personal connection. Um, I don't know if I convinced them, you know, I don't know if just having me as a teacher for a short time was able to reverse any of their anti-Semitism that their culture has taught them for a lifetime. But I, I felt like, in tr I feel like I diminishing racism, diminishing anti-Semitism is about making relationships with the people that you hate, I think. So 
as a teacher, that's what I'm always looking for forward to do. Um, we did have an incident in the middle school a year ago, and I wasn't at my school at this time. I just started this year. It was in Warren, um, where a, a kid, a middle schooler, drew swastikas on his desk. And I was told by the team that he was punished and you know, he was um, disciplined for it. But my question is, that child needed an adult to sit down with them for a day or, or a half a day and have dialogue and be taught about the meaning behind that. Um, what, are, what are your suggestions for how we approach students who don't even know when they call somebody a Jew or draw a swastika, don't even know what they're doing or saying? How can, where do we begin to give them direction and help them not be so ignorant and, and mean? It's a, it's a beautiful, rich, nuanced question that you brought up, and you brought up many different things. And I, with our limited time here, um, you know, I, and even one person can't give a definitive answer. And so this becomes, of course, the conversations with your colleagues, but I'll give you some thoughts. Um, I think you said something that was beautiful about making relationships with those you hate. We're looking at people, and you mentioned that child who draw the swastika, they have no, I can't definitively say that, but by and large, they probably have no concept of what that means. Uh, and often there are different motives from acting out, from being frustrated to whatever, we all know these things. So I think this, this open dialogue with the other is super important. Um, I think uh, target groups like Jews, Muslims, and others uh, telling their stories is super important. I would also, though, argue that um, the responsibility re really lies in the majority of those who aren't in the Jewish community to sort of stand up and self-identify. It's very similar to what we're seeing now, as we're now looking at our own racist past with Black Lives Matter and wondering what questions do we raise of ourselves. And I'm a little uncomfortable, and I hope this comes out the right way, of going to Black people today saying, um, I want you to tell me uh, what I need to do <laughs> to kind of fix myself because I've been wrong. What I'd rather do is to say, what is it in me that has allowed me to do these hateful kind of things? So on one level, it's a dialogue with the self to raise significant questions because we're all human. We all have these, these biases. Um, so that's part of it. I think uh, the other part of all the lessons we do, we must start with whatever target group we're talking about in humanizing them, connecting them. And there are great lessons for this that we can share as well and for any targeted group. But I think when you talked about them going to the synagogue, you suddenly have this demystification that these are human. And when you have uh, Saudis and others coming in, and we often have this with our own summer institute, we have a lot of overseas teachers coming in. They're bringing with them their own history, their own burdens, uh, their own fears, hopes, dreams. And I think the starting point is that starting with their own cultures, their own lives, we'll get to anti-Semitism, but we wanna to get to a common baseline of humanity that has fear, uh, that has anxiety, that still loves their children and wants to make the world a better place. And I think finding that balance between connecting human beings that you so brilliantly did, uh, with then looking at whatever the prejudices are that are affecting us, and then using that outline I gave at the very beginning to say, okay, now let's look at anti-Semitism, how it has been expressed, uh, could be ways that we move forward. But I think we have to recognize that people are human. We have to know where they're coming from. Uh, often, do Black Lives Matter merge with anti-Semitic studies? Absolutely. Uh, I was in uh, Alabama a few years ago, and, and uh, Ron may have been there as well. And I can remember the, the Black taxi driver listening to all this talking coming in from the airport. We're going to a convention on the Holocaust saying, can I ask you guys a question? You know, they just replaced Holocaust History, or I'm sorry, Black History Month with Holocaust History Month. Is that okay? Now listen to a black taxi driver who, of course, she's talking about being ostracized, being targeted, and now she's worried that Black Lives Matter is gonna be usurped by the Holocaust. Well, they're the same issue. They're the same question. It's about targeting, villainizing, and then raising questions about we as human beings embracing those constructs. So I think all of these feed each other. Uh, one of the most beautiful images I can give you is one of my survivor friends from Bosnia. Uh, his name is uh, Vihid Nomanovic. When we were in Sarajevo and the 
Sephardic community in Sarajevo was annihilated in the Second World War. And the synagogue uh, there can't even get a minion uh, on some uh, uh, Sabbath nights. And so we went down to try to help them form a minion, even though I'm not sure if that really works. But my Muslim friend brought us down. And as a Muslim survivor, he walked right into the synagogue, put on his kippah, uh, and sat in the front row. Uh, and I, he says, what are you doing? He says, listen, every night I will sing my kids to bed with a song. One night it'll be a Jewish prayer, one night it'll be a Catholic prayer, one night it'll be a Muslim prayer. Who am I to take away one of the paths of God from my children? It was a typically beautiful Bosnian Muslim approach to diversity uh, and different religious thought. And I think there's something rich there. So I think we recognize where people are from, uh, what fears they bring to the table, and we talk about our common humanity, and then we start looking at specificity about things like anti-Semitism. I think we have uh, five minutes left. So what I, I want to do, and I'm, I'm not going to cut off questions because I'm sure there's still going to be more and this conversation can continue. I want to get to sort of the elephant of the room, I think, with all of the things that we're doing, which is today in Israel. And I'll start with sort of summarizing what we've done today. And this is sort of the father of Holocaust studies, Raul Hilberg, who had said, summarizing it this way, the missionaries of Christianity had said, in effect, you have no right to live among us as Jews. The secular rulers that followed had proclaimed, you have no right to live among us. The German Nazis, at least at last, sorry, decreed, you have no right to live. Anti-Judaism, that first couple of mutations we looked at, means you still can be converted and saved and live among us. And then, of course, they become the devil and unredeemable, which means you're condemned. The Nazi legacy is what we're wrestling with now, which is you must preemptively strike at Jews before they annihilate you. It's this apocalyptic us versus them mentality. And so the question will be in the last slide here or so, is criticism of Israel always anti-Semitic? And so we go back to the earlier definition that I always want to tap into, our working definition, to define what anti-Semitism is and how it's expressed and talk about a couple of things. In France, of course, in Paris in 2015, Charlie Hebdo's attack by two members of an Islamist group. And again, Islamist groups, uh, to me, uh, are perversions of Islam. Uh, and uh, they attack and murder people in Charlie Hebdo and other places in Paris that day. About 2 million people on January 11th, including more than 40 world leaders, met at a rally for national unity. 3.7 million joined to demonstrate solidarity with Jews in France at that time. Unable to hear this volume, I'm not sure we can, and time limits us. You have this woman here who's interviewed during the rally, and she's a Parisian Jew. And the Parisian Jew uh, is being asked how you feel. She says, I feel, um, you know, Jews are being targeted. I'm increasingly afraid, which was the stats we saw at the very beginning of this presentation. She says, but I'm so moved by all these people coming out to say, not now, not here. The reporter says, that's very, very nice, but isn't Israel acting in horrible ways where they're killing Palestinians? So taking this moment whereby it's about recognizing, targeting, remembering here in January, which is Holocaust Remembrance Month, uh, and then perverting that to, I'm ignoring your suffering, I'm ignoring everything I'm seeing, I'm going to now say all this is because of Israel, would be clearly something anti-Semitic. Uh, here, very similarly, and again, these uh, videos are on our YouTube page, uh, the Cohen Center YouTube channel. Uh, on International Holocaust Remembrance Day, uh, the chief rabbi of Britain is uh, being interviewed on the BBC, and he's talking about Auschwitz, he's talking about, and it's a wonderful interview. And then, of course, the interviewer then says, but isn't Israel responsible for much of the evil in the world? Ignoring, of course, uh, the responsibility to remember uh, and then twist it that way. That would be anti-Semitism uh, in the interviewer. But is it always anti-Semitic? And I would say no. Uh, you, one can criticize Israel as it can criticize any other nation so long as what? They don't cross the line, that all Jews are responsible for the actions of Israel or vice versa. Israel is denied the right to exist as a Jewish state. Uh, when one talks about things like the Jews are putting up a wall or Israel is, 
are you concurrently saying, therefore, I also oppose other walls in the world? Uh, traditional anti-Semitic symbols or imagery are used. So here you see one here from a newspaper taken from the medieval blood libel that's now translated into the Israeli, that's been perverted in the Middle East, right? That would be clearly anti-Semitic. Uh, critique, uh, critique, sorry, against policy, political parties. These are all legitimate things we human beings enact in. However, they become anti-Semitic when Jews are seen as having a dual loyalty dual allegiance, uh, blaming Jews or Israel for all the world's problems and region's problems in isolation uh, and ignoring all the other realities. Holocaust denial is not so much denial anymore. That kind of gets squelched with the Irving trial, but it's now distortion. Uh, the Holocaust happened, but it wasn't that bad. Uh, the Jews used it for their own benefit, uh, or even in the case of uh, uh, Pat Buchanan, who was once talking about how the Jews made up the whole thing anyway, uh, and created their issues to, in bizarre levels. So we know the distinctions here. When you see things like this, this is beyond normal uh, political uh, criticism, and this is now clearly anti-Semitic because it's Holocaust distortion. It's saying that here, uh, the middle one here, uh, these are all from the Iranian uh, cartoon contest. Uh, first of all, it's ignoring the history of the Holocaust. It's uh, denying uh, it uh, in, its, in its importance, and then conflating it into uh, political arguments for today that we hear, of course, in our country all the time. Or in the lower left, you have the Palestinians now claiming that they're Jesus on the cross. We saw that from Nazi Germany. Uh, and of course, the Nazis spent a lot of money sending this kind of propaganda into the Middle East in the 1940s. So you can see this stuff is clearly anti-Semitic and beyond the realms. And why is that important? Because when you're doing this kind of stuff, the chances for peace are mitigated. You're looking for right versus wrong. You're looking for conclusions, outcomes, and justifications rather than peace. And so today, when you look at anti-Semitisms, these are recognizable racist anti-Semitic things. But I think the shift that we're noticing now in this fourth mutation is that states are no longer necessarily the prime movers of anti-Semitism. One could argue differently in places like Hungary and Poland today, but uh, by and large, states are rejecting this. Uh, the Germans especially will appear at Yad Vashem in a memorial date saying, we do not support this whatsoever. But that this is now a mass media uh, individual kind of uh, origining uh, place. The internet has empowered uh, these uh, extremist groups and have in many cases made things like QAnon mainstream uh, and it's globally interconnected. The alt-right base is not in the U.S., by the way. It's in, in Budapest. That's where their thinkers come from, where all their uh, material comes from. Uh, truth and facts are sometimes less important for identity than conspiracy theories and lies. We're living in a world where untruth makes sense to a lot of folks. So I don't think the answer is pounding the truth into them. They don't want to hear it. It's looking at why are their identities so threatened that they want to and need to believe in conspiracy theories. This stuff is always present, but with Charlottesville and QAnon, it's now become mainstream and politicized. And again, it's not coming from just the right or just the left, but both simultaneously, which makes it a different phenomenon. And again, by and large, states are responding to and rejecting anti-Semitism. So things are different and it's up to us to identify those things that are anti-Semitic and their sources. So I'll leave you with this particular image of hope, uh, but I'm not a Pollyanna. Uh, it takes a lot of work, but one must recognize what is anti-Semitism. And again, the working definition is not about condemning people. It's about helping them identify and working through their own prejudices. And so here you see a series of images of people recognizing their responsibility, rejecting anti-Semitism, uh, and standing up. And you'll notice they're from mainstream uh, religious groups. Uh, and then finally, of course, I can't believe here we are still fighting Nazis, but it is our call. And I've given uh, these two images here, uh, the alt-right movement, uh, as we know, uh, has origins in the 1920s and 30s with the American Bund marches that we saw in the Madison Square Garden rally. But I wanna leave you with this thought. For the alt-right movement and the uh, white nationalist movement in the US, it has a long, long ideological path in American history, where even at the founding of the nation, we were talking about the blood and soil of our yeoman farmers uh, going west to expand uh, America. 
In other words, when they talked about blood and soil at the Charlottesville rally and pretended to be little Nazis, they were also tapping into expressions of white supremacy that have been around for a very long time. So it's both Nazi and it's also American, and that's what I wanted to identify. So how much time did I leave myself? I think I've run over. We could talk forever. Uh, yeah. They have my email, and uh, we're going to email you afterward anyway. I'll send you my essay if you'd like as well and other documents, but feel free, please, to email me with further thoughts and questions, what worked, what didn't work for you as well in this presentation. And I just wanted to thank all of you for taking two hours out on a on our last summer days here to spend time to care. And uh, I can't thank you enough. So thank you. Oops. Well, Ron, do you want to wrap it up for us? Yeah, just anyway, thank you so much, Tom. I think from the chat and from what people said, they, this was a very important presentation. I know you know, when you think you know something, you realize how much you don't know. And you really helped us understand this subject in real depth. So thank you so much. And we'll look forward to you coming back in the fall. Have a good thank rest of the summer. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for attending. We'll keep, uh, keep looking at our um, social media sites for next programming. You still here, Gary? I'm still here. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I don't know who else is. Uh, other people still here? Most people left. I see a few people. Anybody else? Anybody around who have questions? Or I see Jackie Gould and. Uh, yes, I um, have attended a lot of things. I actually now I live in Florida because my daughter lives here and I have grandchildren. <laughs> but, you're in Florida now. But I, yeah, well, it's never my goal, but it happened. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I was in Brattleboro, Vermont, and um, I was at the Cohen Center a lot. And, um, just, you know, what I just wrote is that there's always new information because it's all still happening. Yeah, that's the sad thing. You know, right, and, right. Um, but I learned so much from Tom every single time. And being here, I'm not in Vermont, New Hampshire, and New England, where most people are more politically like me. <laughs> so that has been an interesting challenge. And I I guess what I had wanted to share with the group is one recently, and I don't need to go into it a lot, but I'll just share with a couple of you because you might find this interesting being that I'm here in Florida. I really wanted to ask people why they vote for Trump because now I know a lot of people who did. And I never used to know many people. And when I, my friends, some of my friends who did have changed their mind, but I- Oh, good. Drive, I know. I was driving past this guy who was, you know, on his lawn with a big Trump sign and he's registering people to vote. And I just pulled over and said, hi. And he asked me, do you want to register to vote? I said, well, I'm already registered, but I'm also not a Republican. And he said, oh, well, that's okay. And I said, but I, I even supported Bernie Sanders. I'm from Vermont, you know, way back. And that was a good icebreaker, actually. <laughs> but I talked to him for two hours. Wow. Wow. And it was really interesting. And he talked about how he separates the policy from the person. Because I asked him, I said, here's a person who makes fun of someone who has disabilities in public before he's even president. And you still decided, and I wasn't really careful how I said it, and you still decided to vote for him. And he said, I separate the policy from the person. And you know, his interest was the Supreme Court and abortion issues and immigration issues. and on and on and on. But the other thing about the Jewish part of this is that at some point, you know, when we were talking about abortion, I said, you know, well, not every religious tradition forbids abortion. Um, and you can do what your religion wants, but in, a, in the United States, we have separation of church and state. I said, for example, I'm Jewish. And he went, it was the classic. And he said, I love the Jewish people. <laughs> and you know, that's what I want to know how to respond to you. I've responded to anti-Semitic things. I responded to someone I liked a lot saying, you know, Jew you down and talking to him about it, realizing I used to say gypped, but I didn't know it was a reference to gypsies. But when someone, and I even have a real, a lovely 
important friend in my life who is a big ally of Jews, but sometimes she says what I've come to call mini, mini aggressions, even complimentary, you know? If I'm gonna have a lawyer, I'm gonna have a Jewish lawyer. <laughs> but what I've decided, the way I explain to it is, you know, I love to accept the good stuff, but if it's a stereotype, I have to accept the bad stuff too. And, when, and I don't want to, so I can't accept either of those. They're all stereotypes. But with this guy, when he said that to me, what I said was, well, I don't even love all the Jewish people. <laughs> I don't know. Right. Okay. But that would be an interesting conversation to have, you know, and specifically, how do we respond, you know, and, well, and it's, it's, Jewish and I'm big minority here in northeastern Florida. I'm not in southern Florida. Oh, you're not. Uh, right. I should have said that to begin with. That changes everything. Yeah. Right. My, son, my son lives in the Keys. Florida Keys, that's a very southern, yeah. Uh-huh. Well, I, I live in outside of Jacksonville. In oh, wow. You are our way up there. Uh, yeah. And it's really interesting. And yet, I do see Biden signs, and I have talked to people who are Trumpers who have changed their mind. And, you know, some of them, it's, I was always a Republican, so I just voted Republican. For some people, it was the Hillary thing, and I've talked to a woman friend of mine. If you're interested in this, I don't have to go on. It's, do you want to hear this? Go ahead. Do that. Okay, well, she said, first she said, well, I, you know, she, what she was anything but Hillary, and she said, well, they broke the law, and it's always they, it's, it's she is him, right? Right. Don't, my dog is very protective, and she's hearing people talk to me, so she's getting all upset. But anyway, and, and I said, well, you know, that was untrue, the whitewater thing, you know, and she said, yeah, I know, I know, and then she said, 